Welcome to Supply Circles, stories from the innovators, disruptors, and improvers in supply chain management today, brought to you by AI Group. Hello, I'm James Scotland, and yes, this is Supply Circles, the podcast that asks the question, how can we in Australia create supply chains that are resilient and sustainable at a time when we are implementing the challenges of the three Ds? You know them, digitalization to keep up with your peers in your industry, decarbonisation to meet your legal requirements and targets by 2050, and in some states even 2045, and ongoing disruptions, which come in many shapes, not only pandemics, but also industry disruptions, product disruptions, logistical interruptions and challenges, global inflation, geopolitics, and so much more. Each fortnight, I delve into different sections of the end-to-end supply chain. I chat with fascinating and interesting people, and we try to have a little bit of fun along the way. And talking about fun and digital business and managing disruptions, my guest today is the spectacular and innovative Melissa Anderson, a seasoned warrior in all of those things. Hello, Melissa. Hey, James. Today's a bit different from previous episodes. For a start, Melissa is joining us today not as a CEO or a company founder or managing director or executive director or any of the other many roles that she's been successful in. It's just Melissa herself, which, of course, is the very best Melissa. Let me explain why Melissa, no title, is joining us. During the multiple years of the COVID crisis in Australia, supply chain managers, operation managers and profit centre managers were under intense and unrelenting pressure to manage the issues that just kept coming. Logistic issues, critical stock shortages, shortages and delays, the need to pivot to new markets, to set up new supply lines, to manage nervous and stressed out buyers, to achieve continued profits despite escalating costs and inconsistent sales. And the answers and the solutions were not clear. It was as, distress, as stressful and unrelenting as it could possibly have been. And it was made even harder by years of organisational 100% commitment to lean and ultra-efficiency. Ultra-efficiency, I'm having trouble today. Which meant supply chain and logistics and procurement departments had staffing and skills levels structured to meet, man, to meet and manage standard operating conditions. There was minimal capacity to manage disruption and chaos. Plus, of course, many of our own jobs came under threat or ended or fundamentally changed. It was tough. It was a tough period to be in supply chain and business management. Over time, the COVID era taught us a lot about ourselves and our careers. It made many of us start to realise the way to view work needed to change. It caused many of us to question what we were doing. What's it all about? Was it worth it? Did you know that according to global research, over 53% of managers were left burnt out in the wake of COVID-19? And this is not a casual term. According to the International Classification of Diseases, burnout is a syndrome conceptualized as resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. It is a diagnosable condition that consists of three symptoms, physical exhaustion, disengagement with working colleagues, and cynicism for one's job and career. In many of the episodes of this podcast in the past, we've spoken on the critical importance of leadership. Today, I want to delve into this uh, very important issue of leadership, the critical important part of managing ourselves in order to look after and nurture others. One solution to the confusion and the disengagement with our jobs and our careers is to break, is to take a break, have an extended break, to take a sabbatical. HR and career advisor company Indeed.com described a sabbatical as a period of rejuvenation. It allows an employee to understand the importance of taking care of their own physical and mental health. And upon returning from sabbatical, the employee may understand just how important it was to their ongoing productivity. Another HR commentator says a sabbatical is the proactive measure to manage stress, preserve a person's physical health, and it helps maintain relationships so they can complete their job duties to the standard that the companies expect. So it's something that we should talk about, something we should embrace, something we must understand as leaders. Our guest today, Melissa herself, is at the end of her year-long post-COVID sabbatical. I'm keen to ask her how it came about, what were the decisions involved, what happened, and what she learned. So let's ask her. 
Melissa, you've been all around the world lately. <laughs> Where are you today? <laughs> I'm on the Sunshine Coast, just near Noosa, on a lovely 10-acre <sighs> property. It's quite lovely. It's been raining here this morning, and uh, the birds have been singing despite the rain. It's a good spot a to be. Of, a bit of warm rain in uh, coastal Queensland. Um, mm. You grew up in coastal country Queensland, I think, didn't you? Yeah, um, country Queensland in Bundaberg. Ah, oh, beautiful. And then we went to yeah. Brisbane Uni, but didn't stay there long. You ended up in China. Tell us that story. Yeah, I moved to Brisbane to finish senior uh, and then uh, went on to university. Um, I wasn't a great university student in my undergrad. Uh, I, I found it kind of boring and not quite exciting enough. So to um, amp up the interest levels, I decided to transfer my degree to study in Shanghai and China. Uh, which I did at Fudan University in Shanghai, uh, and it, it was a great move. Up. <laughs> <laughs> Just a slight way. Did you speak Chinese? <laughs> I'd been learning Chinese at uni. Um, I thought I spoke Chinese, and then I landed and realised I really didn't. Um, but yeah, it, <laughs> I do now. Um, and uh, yeah, so I studied Chinese while I was there as well, continuously, and spoke every day, of course. Um, but yeah, it was a good move. It was a um, I, I really great thing for me to do at that time in my life. Uh, and but it, uh, uh, it was the start of um, of a fast paced career, wasn't it? Because you stayed there yep. and went into business. Yeah, uh, I did. And then I, you went into a digital business. Yeah, I did. I, I started working at the consulate in Shanghai actually for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and that was good. But Again, probably not as exciting as I had hoped for. So while I was there, I, my hobby, I'm a, I'm a bit of a, anyone who knows me is I'm a bit of a geek. Um, and uh, one of my hobbies was programming back in the early days of computing. And, uh, yeah, so I started um, putting Chinese programming, Chinese interfaces on top of software for multinational businesses and other consulates as my sort of uh, side hustle. While I was at the consulate, and I started earning more money and having as, more fun. As you do, you go to China and start <laughs> selling um, programming to Chinese. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. And then what happened? Yeah, yeah, well, I was enjoying it, and I was enjoying it more than my day job and uh, earning more money. Uh, so I jumped ship, started a company, um, and started working with multinationals and diplomatic corps, uh, helping them out with their technology. Um, in fact, it was funny, my mother sent me a clipping um, last week that she came across the, my first newspaper article in a national newspaper in China writing about technology. Uh, and this is going to show my age. It was the transition from floppy disk to hard disk. So, so it's, um, uh, yeah, that was a long time ago. But I had a lot of fun and it was intense. Uh, it was a great environment, highly entrepreneurial. They were just coming out of. Um, you know, uh, deep communism and opening up uh, to the Western world. So the development and pace of development there was addictive and very engaging. Um, and culturally, uh, this notion, particularly in Shanghai, that anything was possible uh, and to be able to kind of build your career in that environment was, you know, it was a real... Uh, I was very fortunate to be there at that point in time. So I did that. And then, again, um, while I was doing that, I had the opportunity to co-found a, a construction company um, uh, and particularly focused on providing Western staff to project manage uh, the construction and development of factories uh, for international companies looking to, to operate in and around China. Mm. How old were you then? I was 24 when we, we when when that happened, and I was I think 22 when I started uh, um, doing some programming work on the side. So you're young, a young young chicken. Going fast, going fast, yeah. Going fast, yeah. Left country, country Queensland, ended up two companies um, in and two successful companies, I think, uh, in China yes. uh, yeah. at 24 years of age. Yeah. What did you learn? Uh, I learnt that uh, the only limit uh, is the limit that you place on yourself. 
uh, and that you are capable or that I am capable and more broadly people are capable of more than they think they are capable of. And, of course, it was a good time to take risks because, uh, you know, I didn't have um, a mortgage or family and I could afford to be bold in the decisions that I was making. So the downside wasn't huge. I mean, the the reality of it, though, it sounds very romantic, but certainly for the first 12 months of me running my own company, I was riding a bicycle to my appointments and getting changed into a suit in the foyers of these multinational <laughs> buildings, <laughs> putting on a very good show. Um, but uh, yeah, it was hard, and there were sacrifices made, but it was it was definitely worth it. And and I think I also learned the power of connections with people, uh, and that um, by and large, most people want to see other people do well. So um, using networks and building teams, and whether they're virtual or inside your own company, is that there is a uh, more often than not there are, are people out there that are, are keen to do well and, and see others do well at the same time. Mm. What do you think uh, Australians have possibly a misunderstanding of the of the Chinese people? Um, there's a, There seems to be a little bit of confusion about what China's all about, and, and then that's created by the political structure. But you dealt with the people one-on-one. Are they? Did you enjoy that? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all of my friends were Chinese. Of course, I had expatriate friends as well, but my preference was to live local. Um, and uh, I, just like everyone else, there, were, there was no difference. I think obviously there's cultural nuances um, around um, um, friendships and how they operate and certainly cultural nuances mm-hmm. around business. Yeah. You know, there is a difference uh, in people's mind around uh things like corruption, what we would regard to be grafting or corruption and, um, and different value systems there. But, um, you yeah, know, by and large, it's, it, was, it was very similar to doing business uh, anywhere else. And, of course, I, my struggle was when I did end up leaving China, all of my reference points for doing business was based on Chinese culture and Chinese business and international business. And when I moved back to Australia, I, I felt quite unsure about how to go about doing business back in Australia. <laughs> it took a little while. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. I, I think it, both of us studied international business and we, we learn a bit about culture formally and then we go into the world mm. and, and try and unpack it. One of the things that always occurs to me is that um, we often say that uh, uh, China and some other parts of the world have a, a Africa in particular, have a, have a different approach to families. But really, we're the ones with a different approach to families. We, you know, our, our land is so far away from, from deep roots, so we don't quite understand the idea of a family maybe multi-generational in places like China. Is that, is that fair? Is, is we seeing the, the importance of family different from the rest of the world? I'm talking about in a business sense too, of course, because often families are the strong, strongest business structure. Look, I would say that there's definitely a difference and it's no accident that when I did move back to Australia, um, I ended up building what is now famously known as the compound, which was a a (laughs) multi-residence home where I moved my parents in with us, with the children and I, so that um, I could have assistance uh, while working and career and raising children. Um, So I did do it if you like, the Chinese way, or indeed you could say the same thing about, you know, other parts of the world, the Italian way, the Spanish way um, of yeah, having an yeah, extended yeah. family. Um, and I think that benefits everyone. And I, and today, even if I reflect on life and business, the, the, the benefits of having a multi-generational and diverse group of people close to you, mm, um, whether yeah. it's in work uh, a work setting or whether it's in a family setting, um, they're definitely there. There's huge benefits in, in having that diversity of age and um, ethnicity and, and even interest. Yeah. So, look, I think we are very different. And the values of um, family and connectedness and um, being able to rely um, in on, on each other in a very deep sense uh, um, enable you in some ways to grow your wings and fly 
Um, certainly if I reflect on my career, I wouldn't have been able to have done all of the things that I've done unless I did have that kind of tight network of people around me to support me. Mm. Yeah, nice, mm. nice. I've been to the compound. Mm. I've been. I've walked, ac- <laughs> yeah. I've walked across the moat and been greeted by the Queen and her clan <laughs> and had a clan like dinner and lunch many times. <laughs> Wonderful stuff. Um, and it's a good, good description of it. Welcome to my castle. Um, <laughs> but your career didn't slow down. And, and uh, I'm sort of uh, trying to paint the picture of what happened to get you to your sabbatical. Um, mm. Your career didn't slow down. You came back to Australia and um, guess what? You started a new business. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, I did start a new business. Before I did that, um, I, I I started my master's in business administration yeah. to try and get my breath and, and work out how to how to do business in Australia. And during that time, I was fortunate to secure a uh, mentor uh, who was a guest lecturer in a master's program, and he was a director on um, Australian boards and other com- uh, companies and. Uh, he agreed to meet with me monthly to help me learn and settle into the Australian corporate landscape. And I ended up through that connection working in group strategy at Suncorp for um, a good few years and understanding how the corporate world worked because my entire reference point was, of course, small and medium-sized enterprises, yes. And so I learned a huge amount in the corporate world and whilst doing my master's, it was good timing. But at the same time, I also learned that – Corporate environments are uh, not necessarily highly compatible with people like me. So if you have mm-hmm. an entrepreneurial spirit, if you're um, adventurous, if you uh, take calculated risks, uh, if you believe wholeheartedly in the power of strong teams and teamwork and authentic leadership and authentic teams, um, sometimes historically corporate environments aren't the best for nurturing some of those um, aspects and I think that's if I reflect on all of the work that you and I have both done with um, SMEs uh, in more recent years uh, that's the power in some respects of our small and medium-sized enterprises is the ability to pivot the ability the higher the, the greater appetite for calculated risk taking, um, the the need, if you like, for very existence to continue to evolve and develop and innovate. Uh, they're all of the things, of course, that excite me, and I'm sure you can hear in my voice. <laughs> um, so, so the corporate world was awesome. Taught me a huge amount about how to do things well when you have big resources to execute, um, uh, and also big politics and big economics. Um, but then I had my hankering was to leave and to go back out and build another company with all of the things that I'd learned, obviously. So there, there were a couple of different companies in between, but um, and ultimately and all over the place, actually, from an industry perspective, um, digital and technology has always been my background hobby, passion, deep dive, uh, and uh, um, I was keen to find a way back into working in technology. But certainly, um, yeah, after that, it was working um, again with my own business, but as a um, uh, contracted to the federal government, working with the Entrepreneurs Program, where I came across AI Group and you, James. <laughs> <laughs> and had, a, a you know, a, a, over a decade of incredible um experience of working with really talented uh, teams uh, and incredible industry partners and, more importantly, some mind-blowingly awesome Australian small and medium-sized enterprises. Yeah, great, really good. But, yes, it, uh, and, you know, as you know, we culminated with uh, with COVID um, and uh, the, the very real and visceral pain that we all felt working with small and medium-sized enterprises trying to navigate through enormous ambiguity and uncertainty, dealing with their private lives, their um, uh, the private lives of their teams, uh, mm, their, mm. Their, their very real cash flow um, uh, pain um, and, and all of the uncertainty that went with it. It was a, quite an incredible experience to 
to be present uh, and to try and in some way help those businesses navigate through it. It was a, a big time. Yeah. One of the big things that came out in COVID for both of us was this um, this, this um, unbelievable um, responsibility felt by um, small business owners to say, I, I can't put my staff off. I have to yeah. have to keep paying them somehow because I'm responsible for them. It's not the other way around. You know, they, they don't work for me. I'm responsible for them. It's very yes. much across a large part nationally. It wasn't just in any part yep. of Australia. Right across the country, in, in rural, regional, and all, every state, there was this idea that people were saying to us, to you and me, I, I, I don't want to put my staff off. I want to keep them going. I want to give them certainty in this uncertain time. It's tiring, yep. though, but that's true. Yeah, it's, and, and it's one of the one of the incredible things that I guess, you know, all of us have advocated to various levels of government over the years around SMEs that they aren't just these business structures. They are actually humans <laughs> working together and in 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 the interest of, of building profitable businesses, but a, a very core purpose uh, behind most of those businesses is the people uh, and this deep sense of commitment to their staff, to their people, and and understanding that those businesses are groups of humans who have lives and mortgages mm. and children at school and uh, yeah, it's um it's a huge thing and and it was humbling to work with those businesses uh, who think that way. Oh, yeah, it's a big time. <laughs> For a couple of years there, I was working trying to uh, do my small bit with. All the people that were trying to unblock the, the logistics um, challenges yeah. uh, during COVID, uh, we, we did see that the companies that were, were better at managing the pivot and managing the disruption were those that had a good digital basis or were digitalized businesses. This is your yeah. area. Do you want to talk to that yeah. for just a second? Um, I'm not sure what the question is, but it's probably about what's the strength of a digital business, I guess, is the overall question, but take it wherever you like. Yeah, look, it's interesting, isn't it? I think the strength of a digital business and increasingly so, you know, um, now even prior to uh, versus prior to COVID is the ability to have real-time information about the state of your business and the state of your supply chain um, and access to that information in a timely fashion made the difference for businesses during COVID. Mm -hmm. So those business, what we evidenced, what we saw was that businesses who could access information, useful information on their on the state of their business in real time yeah. uh, were 10 steps ahead of the businesses that couldn't and had to go, uh, you know, the, the information may have been present in accounting systems or you know, multiple systems, but weren't stitched together in a truly digital sense. And so the delay in actually understanding their real position at any point in time cost them money and yeah, and yeah. inhibited their decision-making and, and put risk on their decision-making that didn't need to be there. So we did see that. And I certainly in terms of supply chain, as you know, James, where we saw massive disruptions to supplies, those businesses that were able to understand what they had on hand in real time and project out timelines and what they needed to do uh, were were faring far better than those businesses who didn't have that in place. Much easier to be brave and bold when you have the information that you need at hand. Um, Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And the decision-making and ambiguity uh, was was much easier um, for those businesses. Yeah, it definitely set them apart. And even if I reflect on our own response, you know, we had a, about 140 business advisors around the country working with um, uh, thousands of business, and we had over 6,000 businesses on the books that we were working with. Uh, we had to stand up technology very quickly so that we could effectively work with businesses in that time. So we had to stand up video conferencing, which was challenging for a government-funded <laughs> program yeah. um, based on cybersecurity concerns and approvals. Uh, we had to stand up knowledge management systems because, as you know, during that time, information was changing on an hourly basis for businesses. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we had to build collaboration platforms so that we could collaborate more effectively. And I guess 
that was just a reflection of what our businesses were having to do as well. And and I guess my hope is, and the thing that I would love to see data around is how many of those businesses took that those steps during COVID and have continued to build on that digital platform going forward. It'd be interesting to have a look back. Yeah, I'd forgotten that, about how, how much work you personally and, and some of the teams from and in some friends of ours, how much effort you put into getting the knowledge system in place so that you could help your clients. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a tough time and tiring, and stressful, and there was a lot at play because these people were saying to us, we don't want to put our staff off, help us out the best you can. And yeah, uh, yeah tough times. No wonder you got to a rather exhausted stage. Let's get back to that in a minute. I want to just pick up something that you mentioned earlier about authentic leadership and situational leadership. For the few years that we did work together, I remember that you were uh, you were trying to build a team. You were, you were starting to build a team of high-performing, highly individual, highly uh, um, uh, skilled senior managers. You were building this team of, of over-performers. And my great advice to you was don't build a team, just build a group, just Give, give them all individual targets and let them go over, go out and slay the world. And you said, but this is what I do. It's my thing. And I'll admit that you built a very good team, the best team in, in the uh, very large structure that you were working in. Why do you love team so much? And, and what has it taught you over the last few years? Uh, well, firstly, I think the... the- do, you, do, do, you think, do you think it's back to that China thing where you, we started off in, the, in this sort of like a, a different approach to, to doing business? I think I think very possibly is that um, I learned quickly that to get things done, particularly in China, you need to build um, um, a network around you like a virtual team uh, to be able to get things done quickly. And you learn that as an entrepreneur as well, as you can't do everything, although you think you can. Um, being able to build a virtual team around you is the most critical thing. And also I learned that delegation and trusting um, a team is critical because if you're not doing the thinking stuff, the strategy piece, uh, and you're too busy with your hands in the business, you're not working on the business, uh, then you're not going anywhere fast. You can't be innovative. You can't be creative. You can't take those bold steps unless you mm, feel mm. that you've got an engine behind you that's got your back and is going right. to perform hard and perform well because they're intrinsically motivated to do it rather than, mm. you know, having a leader that hovers. Um, and uh, so I, I think it's both um, uh, I love people, I'm an extrovert, I'm one of those kind of rare creatures, I'm a geek and I'm an extrovert at the same <laughs> time. But um, so I like having people around me, but I, I'm also uh, a firm believer of employing people and team members that are smarter and faster and more creative than you are. Mm-hmm. Um, it lifts you up. It lifts everyone up. Uh, and I find it really stimulating to be around people like that as well. Of course, there's challenges with that because when you employ people with those characteristics as team members, um, they don't always play well together or gel well <laughs> together, uh, and which was our point of discussion, if you recall, was that um, mm-hmm. I, I felt that the engine needed to play well together, not just individually, uh, and that we'd get a you know a ten x on on performance if we could get these very high performing individuals to not just be high performing in their own lanes, but to lean into other people's lanes and lift them up as well. So it's um and and you know I, I think to the geek point I like complex problem solving, uh, and so that was probably <laughs> a challenge that I was up for. Uh, so yes, yeah, so, look, I really enjoyed it, and I um, reflect on the last twelve months before I took my sabbatical. There was a change in structure and contracts and. Um, and I, I I lost my team, um, and uh, so I was I I, I was um, contracted to be the brain, uh, the strategy, the the person who would set directions, uh, and it was thought that by freeing me up from a team that I would have more time to do more of that thinking, um, and the reality is that as good as my brain may be, it's 
it's fed by the incredible people that I have in my team by listening to them and mm. hearing their stories mm. and their opinions and their anecdotes and uh, hearing what they're seeing on the ground and taking all of that information and assimilating and 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 um, you know uh, creating strategy and direction from that. And so that's the power of a team. That's um, and I didn't learn that. I didn't learn that the reason I started feeling burnt out and the reason that I started feeling disenfranchised uh, toward the end before I did take my sabbatical was because um, I, I was no longer close to the root. I was no mm. longer in touch with our end users uh, and and the people and the conduits toward our end users. And uh, and I, I wasn't sure what was causing the, the the discomfort, if you like. So taking time out to have a think about where I was at and why I was unhappy for the first time in my life, I actually found myself uh, not wanting to turn up for work. Yeah, uh, and, well, that's um, one of those signs that I mentioned before about dis- yeah. disengaged. Yeah, yeah, yeah disengaged, yeah. and I don't like being disengaged. So. Uh, it's time for a sabbatical. It's, it's, it's interesting what you say because you said you're an extrovert. Carl Jung was the one that came up with the idea of introvert and extrovert, and he said mm. an extrovert was someone who gets their power by being with other people, their, their energy, you know, like their, their, yeah. their power source, uh, whereas other people may be really outgoing and, and quite boisterous, I'm being one, but I get my power by, being, by going off and being on my own. Uh, mm. I rebuild. Mm. I rebuild. Mm. And the difference between extrovert and introvert isn't someone who, can stand up in front of a crowd of people and talk. It's about where you get your energy from. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah. So to take away your energy source is just tiring. And we saw a lot of that during during COVID, where people just had everything change around them and it just exhausted them. Um, one of the things that made it difficult for one of the things that you enjoy, but I know that it's stressful, is this dare to fail, uh, fail fast. Uh, you give you empower people to to make mistakes, but that's also a bit stressful when you've got to. Um, when you're in a bureaucracy or within a, a corporate structure, isn't it? Mm, it is. And and well, I think it's probably stressful in an SME as well because oh, the sure. consequences yeah. are even, re- even more bigger, real. <laughs> but um, I, I think in a, in a corporate sense, certainly I, on two fronts, um, if you're a technology-focused person, which I am, as well as being uh, focused on innovation and change and uh, continual growth, then um, you find yourself at the forefront of discussions inevitably uh, that are constantly trying to educate and change people's perspectives. So particularly around technology, technology is a hard sell uh, in any environment. It's usually high risk, high cost. Uh, it has a human toll uh, in terms of change management uh, and fear. Uh, and so I found myself particularly <laughs> reaching some exhaustion points around being constantly being the point person leading change uh, around technology and the way things should work. Um, it, it is, it's tough. And it's interesting, though, I think if you, to your question about the risk uh of allowing team members to fast fail uh if you have faith in your team members capabilities skill sets and experiences then it is much easier to allow them the liberty to experiment and fail uh, and that comes to building it, investing in and taking the time to build a high performing team is and 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 having confidence in their autonomy. Uh, and and that's not a tokenism, that that's real. and and when yeah. it's real, yeah. then then I'm always happy to 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 provide cover <laughs> on yeah. high risk and endeavors. yeah, yeah. so from a um, uh, from a young a, a young girl that left a country. Castle Queensland went to China and built some businesses. Came back, built some more businesses. Worked in corporate, built teams. Uh, went through the uh, pandemic at the forefront of trying to assist Australian businesses and and having a big team. You got to a stage where you were a little tired. Yeah. <laughs> <And> we, <laughs> 
Yeah. Uh, I'm just tired <laughs> listening about to it. Uh, <laughs> but when we come back, let's talk about uh, how you came to the decision uh, and then what you did. We'll come back in a second. Okay. If you have supply chain or business improvement challenges, contact AI Group's Business Improvement and Growth Hub. The Big Hub is a library of practical and relevant resources designed to assist member businesses to grow and improve. The Big Hub also includes an extensive network of experienced, pre-qualified business improvement consultants. For more details, contact big at aigroup.com.au. That's big at aigroup.com.au. All right, Melissa Anderson herself is uh, telling us about uh, the career today. But now let's talk about how you got to that stage of being tired and demotivated and disengaged, all the things that we mentioned uh, burnt out means. Did you recognise it as burnout or did you think, no, I'm just, I've just got to get away? I think, uh, well, taking a step back, throughout my career, I... Um, I've I've uh, always sought out sort of leadership, um, sort of coaching or support externally, mm-hmm. and I came to the conclusion that I do actually need to take out time throughout every year. I go hard, but every year I take four opportunities to go and and have an adventure. Okay. Uh, and uh, and I had been very disciplined about that throughout my career. That four times a year I would go off and have an adventure. I said that like I didn't know, but your adventures are insane. <laughs> <laughs> Climb to the top of a mountain somewhere or do something wild. Yes, yeah, do something wild. And and there's a couple of reasons for that because, and it's always on my own, uh, and the reason for that is that uh, I believe that the best strategy formulation happens when you have silence around you and you can take the time Mm -hmm. to bring in all of the disparate strings and pull them together and assimilate those into uh, a thought or into into a way forward and uh you know paul keating used to do that he he was famous for the amount of um, white papers that he produced in his time in government and part of the way in which he used to do that was to hive off days in his week where he wasn't part of the media circus and the cycle of politics, uh, listened to classical music loud in his office and, um, and, and think. Um, And so Mm, for me, that's mm. what I would do on my adventures. I would challenge my limits and think uh, often walking in the wilderness for days on end uh, and come Mm, back feeling mm. refreshed and revived. And so coming to the decision to leave and go on a sabbatical, it was the same it was the same thought process is that uh, I can keep running hard and be increasingly unhappy with where I'm at or I can stop what I'm doing, go off and give my brain time to stop and think about what makes me happy, where do I want to go, what do I want to be when I grow up um, and those sorts of things. So, yeah, that's how it came about. Is Did you decide to take a year off and was it scary to have that long away from your career? Yes. <laughs> to both? Yes, yes to both. Yes, I decided that I was going to take a, at least a year. I thought maybe 18 months, and it's probably going to end up being about 18 months. Um, and, uh, yes, it was scary. Um, it's scary from a number of angles, you know. Um, obviously, financially, uh, it's, a, it's a thing. Uh, it was also scary from the perspective of, you know, I'm, I turned 50 and uh, there's a, a an age cliff in careers and uh, I thought, well, this is kind of a high-risk time to step off. I felt um, also concerned that I would have, wouldn't have my finger on the pulse of mm-hmm. day-to-day uh, innovations and business life and technology and and uh, all of those things. So, yeah, it was a scary thing to do. And a lot of people thought I was... Or a brave thing to do. Bold. <laughs> Bold. A lot of people thought I was slightly um, slightly crazy, 
making the decision to do it. But it was absolutely 100% the right thing to do. Yeah. Women have to take time out of their career to, to often take time out of their career to have, to have babies. So they take a yeah. year here or seven months, six months there. Yeah. And there's been this whole question for many years about how do we to make sure that uh, the, the female advancement is happening as fast as the ones that aren't stepping out uh, mm. of their career. Uh, to do it in mid-career, just to go and have a sabbatical, to me makes a whole lot of sense. I just wonder how it's going to pan out for people who are in the corporate world or who are deeply invested in a, in a structure that says, oh, I'm not sure that's such a good idea. Yeah, and I think it's um, – I mean, the irony is I've been slowly coming – emerging from my um, sabbatical and starting to dip my toes back into reading our business press and – um, you know, technology press and, um, you know, kind of gearing myself back up to yeah. to be in the race again. The the irony is, of course, nothing's changed. <laughs> <laughs> I know. The, well, it hasn't I, changed a little wait, bit. The good bit, is, the good bit is that we're hearing more and more of, of families, mum and dad, both of whom are working, are taking a year off and going caravanning and taking the kids around Australia. Well, absolutely. Young, Look, without, yeah. without any inhibitions on the career, which is just great. Yeah. So that's the only thing that has changed. But I guess it, that's it. That's the thing. I, I you know, the, the 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 basic tenets of doing business in the world have not changed, and uh, things. I think what happens, uh, and this is the myth, is that when we're in the machine working day in day out and putting in big hours, we pack so much into a day hmm. that we hmm. think, how can you take a year out and not fall behind? But mm. in reality, when you stand a hundred feet back from from that day uh, that you've just done, there is nothing terribly remarkable in that day mm. <laughs> that uh, isn't part of normal working life. So I, I I don't feel like I've missed out on anything. And leaning back in, I actually come with this incredible, fully charged jetpack. Uh, that right. I definitely. Oh my God, have. we're all scared now. <laughs> I know, and curiosity, you know, real oh, genuine man. curiosity. So I, and I, I know for sure. I, I, whilst I'm always a curious and energetic person, as you know, uh, that was waning, and yeah. and I've now I've I've got a truly much greater capacity than I would have had if I hadn't have taken time out. And, you know, I, the questions that I had about myself and what I want to be when I grow up, I didn't answer them. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought I thought I would have answered them. I know what I don't want, um, uh -huh. and I guess that's important. I know what I don't want in my life, and, and, um, and navigating away from those things is important. I found out things about myself that I kind of – I guess in the subconscious I knew, but I found them out because I was more tuned in. And uh, those things that I found out about myself, I'm, I'm, I'm using to navigate forward in the next stage of my career. Mm. As far as I know, you've always been keen on people being productive uh, and effective and not busy. You know, neither yes. of us particularly like busy. No. Were you able to not be busy while you were having your sabbatical? Did you, you, know, did you chill? No. <laughs> <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I tried. I tried really hard. I just don't think it's my DNA to. Um, I have to try really, really to hard to chill. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's medication for that, right? So, um, <laughs> uh, no, yeah. I, I do have an engine that goes uh, goes hard. But I, in, I do in my own way. So, you know, being in nature, being out on top of mountains, uh, being mm -hmm. on the ocean, all of those things, um, you know, were activities that I was regularly engaging with. Uh, and in those places, my mind is still. And, right. and, okay. and, yeah. and that, would be, that would be the idea of other people's chilling out, I imagine. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't matter how you get to still. It doesn't matter no, how you find the space in your mind. You just have yes. to go and find the space in your mind, whichever way it is that, that gets you there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Did you yeah. go to anywhere spectacular or any, any, share any sort of mind-boggling moment in the last four months or was it really just a day-by-day a day -day life? 
I day by day life, and um, I tried to. Um, I plan a lot uh, normally in life. So <laughs> one of the goals was to not over plan uh, during the twelve months and to allow it to evolve somewhat. Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. I, some of the most mind blowing moments I've had has actually just been still uh, in yeah. places in nature um, and allowing allowing my mind to be just really present in the moment. Um, so, you know, yeah, on top of mountains, there's been plenty yep. of that climbing mountains. Um, you know, as you know, I rock climb. So being outdoors, rock climbing is a moment of flow for me um, where I'm just very focused on staying alive. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but, you know, focused on my body and its movement and nature mm-hmm. and my surroundings and where I'm at. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there was a plenty of things uh, um, from an adventure point of view that uh, really, um, uh, I guess, made my year. I made up yeah. for the last couple of um the last 18 months and certainly during COVID, I couldn't do my four adventures a year. Yeah, so yeah. I felt like there was some catching up to be done. I always like, the, uh, as you know, I like to, to travel alone. And so I, I always mm. think it's weird seeing a plane that's traveling at 600 miles an hour or something and trying to be still. <laughs> trying to meditate at 600 miles an hour. I love it. <laughs> I love the irony. But also, I mean, I, I, many places around the world, but one of the things that always occurs to me is that the, 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 the Many many days of being in Arnhem Land in uh, Northern Territory, uh, and mm. I'd be sitting on top of a rock, looking out, thinking, "People have been doing this for sixty thousand years. You know, this is just amazing. I can sit here so quietly and peacefully, and, and know that there's a whole history of the world around me. It's just a really nice feeling, and it does help you open your mind and de-stress when you know that life is just life. You know, everyone's doing the same stuff. We're just finding new ways to die yeah it is and i i find it really interesting i always stitch this back to technology because i am a geek but you know people often think about technology and digital as uh this horrible kind of zero and one mathematical geeky kind of thing and it's and people are often scared of it or resentful or um feel overwhelmed by it but it actually is just this great little tool and if you think about it as something that helps you do the things that you want to do and get to those adventure breaks and things like that, it's, it becomes a friend. And I think for me, when I say that I need to go off and have alone time to allow all of the different threads to come together in my mind and be creative, technology is yeah. just a tool. It's actually the creative brains that operate it that get the job done and that can be in any sense and so sitting on top of a mountain observing where you're at uh, and nature and everything around you allows your brain to relax and there's a lot of great research into movement in nature and and how that increases your um, intellectual capacity and your thinking capacity and the outcomes and if I think about it that way it's like you know, everyone's talking about chat GP, GPT and, you know, it's making AI real for the every man um, and democratising it to some extent. But it's still only a tool. It's actually just a website, you know, that you sit and interact with or back into an app and you ultimately drive it through your creativity. And some of the best mm-hmm. uses that we've been seeing in viral, you know, um, socials has been around the creative use of technology. It's the creativity of the questions and the tasks and the way that you think you can ask it to do something that is actually the real value. And if we don't take sabbaticals, if we don't take time to nurture our brain and give our our brain time to relax and be creative, then we're going to fall behind You know, from my perspective, that actually is more productive than me going to work five days a week uh, and pressing the metal for five days a week and having an exhausted brain that's tired from being busy. It's much better for me to go off on a hike, relax it, get it creative, create space for thinking and to come back and use those tools to do the grunt work, the busy work, 
uh, and use my amazing creative brain and your amazing creative brain to drive that technology to better outcomes. So for me, I kind of think about my sabbatical in that way. It's, you know, feeding my brain. It's it's allowing it space and time to be creative again and energised um, to be able to come back into the workforce. And so instead of me thinking that I will be an inferior candidate for a role in, a, in an organisation because I've taken a year out, I actually think it's a great asset to any organization that I've taken the time to feed my brain and relax and become creative again uh, and energized. Yeah. And I think it's definitely something that we should all be thinking about in the in terms of our careers is that we throughout our careers take that time. Yeah. I think that's a, a great explanation of why we should. Um, stepping back into my uh, my role as consigliere to uh, to you, Melissa Anderson, <laughs> it sounds to me like it's time for you to go back to work. You're full of energy when you started talking <laughs> about digital. You got very excited as always. Um, <laughs> And so a great place to stop. I think that's a great explanation as to why you need to have a break. Mm. Um, wish you well in whatever you do next. Um, Thank you. Good luck to to the poor folk who have to put up with Melissa's energy and drive with excitement <laughs> and team building. Um, to finish, just one question. Do you think you'll take another sabbatical? Yes, definitely. Uh, without a doubt. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I'm not sure when it will be. Um, but I, I would like I think to think. That's the point, though, isn't it? Yeah, that's the point. You don't plan sabbaticals that much. No, but I think it's about listening to your body and listening to your mind and 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 working on it that way. And I, you know, we all kind of have this thing. This we, we're programmed to think about retiring, and I, I don't want to retire. That's not. It's not in my agenda. Mm-hmm. I don't think about it in that linear sense of saving hard and, you know, working hard to this end goal of retiring in your, you know, your 50s or your 60s. Uh, For me, I'd much rather think about it as, you know, working hard, um, you know, providing for yourself so that you can every few years take time out in the moment, you know, while you can uh, and the benefits for the people that you end up going back to work with the benefits for yourself, for your family, if you have one. I think I think that's the way we need to rethink the way we we work and live. Is yeah. that it's not sort of hard pressed till you're fifty, sixty. It's you know work no. hard, take a break. Work hard, take a break. Uh, yeah. Anyway, that's what I'm the, aiming for. The same the same way that that Olympic athletes do. Olympic athletes train really hard, like insanely hard, push their bodies to the limit, mm. and then they take a break. They have a complete rest. And then they come back and do it again and then have a complete rest. And the way to become high performing is to go through this intensity, rest, intensity, rest. Um, we need to rethink um, retirement. Maybe we'll talk about that at another stage. My dad worked in a very, very a large global organization uh, for his whole career. And when he retired, he got given a gold watch, which was this sort of physical example of a bunch of wheels and a cog and cogs working together. Uh, and it was like, they said, congratulations on being a cog. In, you know, um, that's what your whole, your, your whole life came down to the symbolism of a gold watch. And, and all of that time. Swipe. Yes. No, it's yeah. not. Do you want and time. Yeah. I forgot to factor in the time, but it's, yes. it's time. Yeah. And, yeah it and takes wheels all the cogs. time you've given us. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. And what oh, little awesome. time you have left at a time in your life where you can't do all the things you want to do. It's yeah. an insane concept, isn't it? So what about you, James? Yeah. Are you going to take a sabbatical? <laughs> well, that's very clever. Yes, I'm. Uh, when you hear this, I will be in, uh, in Europe and in Africa having a, having a, a break, uh, and at some stage I will take a, a long sabbatical. But I'm having fun. These, these things are too much yeah. fun for me to take too long a break. Uh, <laughs> and there's, there's things to do, lots of fun things to do and meet people. Um, but thank you for asking anyway. And yes, uh, I think when this episode drops, I'm cycling the Bavarian lakes, so uh, <laughs> I'll be a long way from a long way from reality. Yeah, well, or maybe hopefully, deep in reality. 
Hopefully you'll have a, a couple of bottles of wine tucked into the backpack so you can pull over and enjoy the view. <laughs> uh, Bavarian beer, I think, Melissa. Beer. <laughs> anyway, we must go. That's it for another episode of Supply Ch- Circles. Thank you to Melissa Anderson and thank you to everyone for listening and for your feedback. If you have any feedback on today's interview with Melissa or ideas for the show or you just want to give me some feedback, Hit me up at james.scotland at aigroup.com.au. That's one T in Scotland, james.scotland. Or at my LinkedIn page. I'd love to hear from you. And despite me being in Germany, we'll be back in a fortnight with more insights into the keys to building sustainable supply chains. Thanks for joining me. This is Supply Circles, and I'm James Scotland. Bye for now.